Rosenthal and King. Thank you, Chair Drum. Uh, we in the council and the city are lucky to have you as the education chair. Uh, I'd like to first uh, thank uh, our chancellor for facilitating my visit of every school in my district. So far, I'm up to 18 of the public schools in my district, right. which is amazing. And I hope that other folks follow suit uh, all the way up to the governor. We should be visiting our schools and really uh, visiting and knowing what's going on. I also want to thank you for your assistance with high school voter registration. I've been working with DOE over the past couple of years to register high school seniors. This year we did a pilot. I was curious whether or not we, now that we've done a, a pilot, if we are ready to now roll it out as something that can be done programmatically uh, through the schools. And I have a number of questions, so to the extent we can go back and forth quickly, I'd like to address uh, food issues as well as uh, women's equity issues as well. Okay, what's the question? Uh, can, we, can we bring high school uh, senior voter registration in as a programmatic uh, ongoing program versus just doing it as a pilot on a catch-as-catch-can basis? Well, we've been doing a lot more of the senior voting registration, but why don't you and I meet to discuss what it would take to move it from the pilot forward? Perfect. The next sad reality is I believe New York State is now 49th out of 50 states in terms of voter turnout. And so one question with regard to behavior is what would happen if 1.1 million children every year from when they started with their schools uh, and till they graduated voted on election day or the day before in their schools and they got in the habit of doing it every single year and did it 12 times before they turned 18, how likely would they to be to vote once they turned 18? And what would our voting demographic look like 12 years from now when 1.1 million children had grown up voting? I totally agree with you. I think it's an embarrassment uh, our voters turn out, not just in this city, but in this country. There are many countries that hold their voter, uh, voting days on Sundays and I was in Turkey when um, they were voting, and one of the things that's there, if you don't vote, you lose a day's pay, because that can be your protest vote, but you lose a day's pay. So I do think this is something we absolutely have to work on. I would love to work with you on bringing mock voting into the schools. Uh, with regard to hunger, the, the sad reality is that in the wealthiest nation in the world, hunger is still rampant, especially in this city. One of the things we can do about this is lunch for learning. Uh, which is providing free lunch to all of our all 1.1 million. I really appreciate that we've done it for the middle schools. Is there a uh, chance to expand it into upper schools where peer pressure is really what dissuades kids from using uh, the, the free or reduced vouchers? And then in your testimony, you mentioned that it cost the city funding, but it's my understanding that we did receive USDA reimbursement. So is there a plan to expand? Uh, what are the real costs of the city versus the federal government? Well, first of all, it doesn't cover the cost of what we've done. And I want to be clear that with middle school lunch, we did more than provide free lunch. We changed the environments in many of the schools. Uh, that's why we have the seven model schools. I invite you to visit any of the seven. In one of the schools, we put in a jukebox. We put in booths. We put in a deli-type feeding counter. We painted the cafeteria so it's more exciting. And, and because it's a, with that age group, it's not just about eating, it's about relaxing, sitting down. We, have, we put in board games. We did a lot of things. One of the other uh, model sites has now where the students choose and develop their own menu every six weeks based on the ethnicities in that particular school. So we really need, if we're going to eventually start spreading um, the lunch, to really figure out where the money's going to come from. I would certainly, given this pilot, be willing to rethink that. But, you know, I think we need to be very careful in terms of where's the money going to come from. And every time you put money in something, it comes out of something else. But I, I do think the middle school lunch program has turned out very well. I, I like to take my money from the federal government, uh, especially oh, while you and me both. So how much funding can we count on for uh, the free lunch program as well as um, breakfast after the bell, which is fully federally funded? Can we roll that out and to, to all 1.1 million children? Yeah. I think this requires a more extensive conversation than just answering here. Perfect. Uh, my, my final question uh, is with regard to, I, I serve on the Women's Issues Committee 
and I know I'm going over my time, but I'd like to at least lodge it, and if you can answer it now or answer in writing to the committee later. The fiscal 2016 preliminary budget includes $214,000 for varsity girls teams in an effort to comply with Title IX. According to the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Civil, Civil Rights, the city would have to add 3,862 more sports opportunities to comply. The funding added in fiscal year 16 only adds 12 teams. What further plans, if any, does DOE have to comply with Title IX and, uh, so that we can offer all the women who attend our schools the same opportunities as the men with regards to athletics? Uh, and, and to the chair, would you prefer the answer now or just later? No, that's okay. We can do it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, it's 12 next year, and it's uh, an additional 12 over the next four years, year after year. So it's 12, 24, 36, 48. So it is only 12 uh, initially. And, of course, we, we, would, we are committed to expanding this um, to the extent possible. But, again, without additional funding, it's very difficult to... Uh, to, to do everything we want to do. But this also goes to the fact that we've asked the community-based organizations in community schools, uh, which, which there'll be an additional 128, that part of what they should be doing in after school is providing more physical activities as one of the things they do. We've asked for more mental health activities, more physical activities, and more arts activities to be part of the services that they provide. Thank you, and thank you to the chair and the members of this committee. Thank you, uh, Council. I want to focus a little bit uh, on uh, Community Education District 2. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what I represent, uh, as well as uh, Council Member Chin, Council Member Johnson, Council Member Mendez, and Council Member Grodnick. There's a lot of us, and a lot of us came out today because our district is higher needs than most would think, uh, and ultimately just trying to make sure that we are asking for the amount of funding that we need uh, and making sure that your agency is doing that as well as uh, our body. So according to the December 2014 uh, report, uh, DOA has identified a total need of 49,245 seats citywide. The December plan included funding for construction of 31,823 new seats, leaving an unfunded or partially funded need for 16,616. And so by way of planning, I feel I'm, I'm concerned that we might be setting ourselves up for failure. So if we have an identified need for 49,000, why not build 49,000 or perhaps more so that we actually don't have to uh, worry about having schools that are overcrowded? And while we would love to have more to build as many as possible, you know, we do have a lot of competing priorities and limited funding. So it's that simple. We had to decide. We, we certainly have buildings, existing buildings, that need capital improvement, and a large portion of our plan had to uh, address those issues. So, um, you know, we did what we included as far as uh, the 32,000 was really um, as close as we could get to the number of seats that we accomplished in the last plan. We felt that that was a reasonable number. But again, it is a matter of competing priorities. I, I, for one, would say I don't believe that there is a higher priority than education. An investment in education returns uh, several fold over our city's lifetime, and uh, we get our expense funding from income. And uh, when people have a better education, they earn more. So how much would you need in order to be fully funded for your identified need? We would need, what, I'm sorry? An additional, uh, yes, we would need an additional $1.7 billion. $1.7 billion more. That, that is great. When I got elected, we had $73 billion expense budget. Now we have a $77.7 billion expense budget. So as our expense budget continues to grow and our capital budget also continues to grow, I think we should be advocating for as exactly as many seats as we uh, need. Uh, along those same lines, I was proud to work with so many of the people here uh, to fight for universal pre -K. I'm glad we've got it. I was disappointed that we got something like 50 seats in uh, Council District uh, 5, and uh, we actually lost pre-K seats in the district with the uh, closing of Rhinelander, which was uh, subsidized by the uh, uh, by a foundation, and uh, so we actually had a net loss of pre-K seats. Uh, when meeting with the mayor, he indicated that he was willing to put temporary pre-Ks in empty classrooms. Mm -hmm. I 
have identified to the mayor and uh, to the Department of Education several locations for uh, universal pre-K locations. And I know there is need because parents keep asking me, can we use some of the vacant school spaces? Uh, I have a lot of new schools. So they are a, a, an elementary school and they're now up to third grade, but they have the second the, the fourth and fifth grade classrooms completely empty while they're waiting to grow in, which means we have two years of classrooms that we could use uh, for pre-K at several buildings. Uh, so I'll, I guess I will ask again, can we get pre-K in more spaces in my district for the, the much greater need than 50 seats? So I'm going to uh, guess that you're referring to the Our Lady of Good Council building in PS 527, I think. Really impressive, yes. <laughs> if not the only one. I also have another one at, in the same, co-located with PS 158. and uh, Where the middle school is phasing in. Yes. All right. So I will certainly, from this meeting, go back and follow up with uh, Sophia Pappas, who you, many of you met this morning. She was here for the expense budget hearing and understand whether there's potential or what the plans are for um, whether there's an opportunity to use some of that space on a temporary basis. I... With regard to uh, building, I'm, I'm very pleased to see that uh, CE, the Community Education District 2 will be getting 3,190 new seats. I am slightly concerned, however, because we are putting in, we, we are, my, my district is, is, is getting raised and warehoused. And uh, we're now in the age of the super scraper. So uh, in my district, we're going to be getting a 900 foot tall building, 90 stories, uh, which will, likely have nine, 900 units or something crazy like that, and we're seeing thousands and thousands of units of development, talking about tens of thousands in CEC2, um, and yet we're only building for 3,190. Uh, would it be possible to make sure that, our, uh, that, that we are at least being able to see the equations and data that you are using to contemplate why we need so few seats while the city is about to undergo an unprecedented construction and especially with the mayor's new zoning plan which is going to encourage even more development um, I don't think we can keep up sure um, yes I certainly will certainly get that information to you but in addition to that uh, we update the these numbers we do demographic studies every year to update and keep up with what has been unprecedented development and certainly we'll continue to look at that but if you'd like to meet with us separately to go over the, these issues we're happy to do it if you can share the underlying demographic data, that would be exceptional. My sure. last question is with regard to gifted and talented. Uh, and I think it falls on the special education spectrum because you have both needs, you have people, uh, both, both are high needs po uh, populations, uh, and it's just for, for different ends of the spectrum. And so in 2013, there were 36,012 children who applied for gifted and ta talented, and of those, 25% are in the 90th percentile or above. We are truly an amazing city. Uh, and that comes out to 9,003. And that is, I have a, a couple of schools with GNT in my district. I, I went to Bronx Science, I believe in gifted and talented programs. It's a good way to be somewhere for a little bit of time that nobody's gonna beat you up for being a smart kid. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if that was Margaret's experience as well. She also went to Bronx Science. But um, uh, the question is, all these schools have wait lists. Can we actually build the, the 9,000 GNT seats that we need? So, um, as the chancellor said at uh, a District 2 town hall uh, a year ago, all of our schools in District 2 are gifted and talented schools because, as you pointed out, there are so many students who qualify that what you end up with is a, a very strong academic culture in all of the schools. Um, what we find is that families who are applying to gifted and talented programs uh, are very interested in a very few specific gifted and talented programs. Um, and that if they don't get into those specific programs, they want to be at their zoned neighborhood school. And particularly in, in your council district, those schools are very strong and families are very um, happy with those local neighborhoods. So it's not that there are not a need for 9,000 additional seats, those students, it's just a question of which schools those students choose to attend. There's capacity across the system for all of the District 2 students. Thank you and thank you to the Chair. Thank you. I just want to follow up on that um, questioning about gifted and talented. 
in District 30, for example, uh, we don't have enough seats. So there's a situation which I think you're aware of where students attend a school in Councilmember Kalos's district on Roosevelt Island. Uh, those students cannot get busing because they go to the school on Roosevelt Island, which is technically Manhattan, and another school district. I think we spoke about this with former Deputy uh, Chancellor mm -hmm. Kathleen Grimm as well, but that number seems to be increasing from my district and from Councilmember Van Bremer, Councilmember Constantinides, and I would really like to relook at that issue to see how we might be able to accommodate those parents um, so that they can get some time to have transportation to go there um, and would uh, welcome a discussion on that with you further. I'd be happy to have a separate discussion. Thank you. Um,